Hi everyone, welcome to the channel. It's Sebastian Boy, the Approved Guy, and on this episode, we are going to be interviewing Nathan Akers of National Gold Consultants. He's the Director of Advisor Relations for over four years, and this is going to be a great interview for you to learn about precious metals and how that can add value to your investment and your financial portfolio. Without further ado, let's get right to it. Hi, Nathan. How are you? I'm doing well, Seth. How about yourself? Fantastic. Thank you so much for joining the show today and uh, sharing your time and, and your expertise with us. If you would, tell tell the audience just a little bit about yourself and your background and, and how did you end up with National Gold Consultants? Yeah, great question. So I started out in the financial service industry a little over 20 years ago at this point. was an advisor. Uh, I've got an MBA in finance and Basically, I got interested in gold and silver during the, the 2008 Great Recession that we had, you know, just sitting across the table from folks, you know, everything was going down, people were looking for safety. And I started having people ask me about gold and silver. And that's really when I started, you know, kind of digging into, you know, hey, wh what's the deal with gold and silver? How come no, you know, financial professionals seem to talk about this at all? Um, and what I really realized is it's it's one of the easiest, simplest asset classes for people to own, but it's so often misunderstood and it's definitely underutilized. And people make it very complex, but it's it's not. Right. Um, and so a little over four years ago, I made the switch from being an advisor, working directly with clients to you know, working at National Gold Consultants, helping, you know, kind of being an advisor to advisors, just to helping more people, you know, talk about physical gold and silver with their clients and help them get into this asset class. Because I think they really need it with everything yeah. that's that's coming. Yeah, I agree with you. And that's, it's great that you're, you know, you've made that transition and you're helping to educate people and helping advisors. And so I, I know I've been learning a lot from you guys about gold and precious metals and and one of the things that I, I really res really resonated with me, one of the, I guess, key word phrases that I, I saw you guys use is gold or precious metals as a wealth insurance almost. Um, yep, exactly. Let's just go right into that. Like, what, what, do you, what do we mean by that when we say that gold and precious metals is, could be looked at as wealth insurance? Yeah, so what we really mean by that is so many other companies position gold or silver as this, you know, get rich quick scheme, you know, hey, buy gold, buy silver, and it's going to go way up in value. Mm -hmm. But when you're looking at gold and silver, you really have to think about it as an insurance type product. You know, we, we don't want people to put all of their money into gold and silver. This should only be, you know, 10 to 15% of their portfolio. But what happens is you buy it and then you hold it until the next, you know, major economic storm comes. You know, kind of like buying an insurance product. You buy it hoping that you don't need to use it, but it's there when you do. Mm -hmm. And so that's how gold and silver really acts as a wealth insurance product. When everything else is falling, that's when gold and silver really increases in value. It just helps you cover losses in other parts of your portfolio. I see. That makes sense. So what you're saying is I shouldn't be looking at gold and silver as a as an investment strategy for me to build well to replace my other investments but more as a protection of volatility buffer if i may yep. in the event of crisis because that's when the yep. value increases and that's when it's really going to become advantageous to me yeah absolutely that is exactly what i'm saying right there um i always explain to people you know if you think of all of your other investments um, and you think of them as being on a seesaw. Mm -hmm. um, so everything you've got, whether it's, you know, the dollar or money that you've got in the stock market or real estate, those things all move together. Um, but most people don't have anything else on the other side of the seesaw to balance out when everything else goes down in value. So gold and silver is really just kind of that counterweight um, that balances out everything else in your portfolio. It's about keeping balance. How much gold and silver should I be buying? What's yeah. the difference between doing that way or actually having physical gold and silver in my possession? Yeah, so so within a you know, within a qualified retirement plan, whether it's like an IRA, a four oh one K, a four oh three B, anything like that, um, you have the option you could buy physical gold and silver inside of that account, 
or you can buy, you know, what we refer to as paper gold and silver, which is really going to be like a, you know, an ETF of gold and still silver, an exchange traded fund or a mutual fund. And the problem is, you know, those those financial instruments, um, they are basically they're they're paper gold and silver. You think you're buying gold and silver, but really what those companies are doing, they're not buying the actual gold and silver. They're buying gold and silver futures. Um, so you think you're owning gold and silver, but you're not owning the actual gold and silver. And then that gold and silver, they're turning around and they're selling it. You know, they're, they're highly leveraged. So they're selling that same, you know, paper to 200 other people oftentimes. That's why with physical gold and silver, you know, you have it, you know, it's there when you need it. So whether you're using money inside those retirement accounts or money outside of retirement accounts, physical is the way to do it. Amazing. Now, there's also a difference, not just in, you know, the fact that it's tangible and, and it's in my possession versus paper, you know, yep. um, but there's there's a difference in actual value as well, isn't there? Correct. Yeah. Yeah. With So the, the way I explain it to folks is with gold and silver, if you go online and you look up, you know, hey, what's the price of gold or what's the price of silver? They're going to report to you the spot price of gold and silver. And really that's derived from gold and silver futures. The easiest way to think about that is that's the value of an ounce of gold or an ounce of silver that's in the ground right now. Mm -hmm. um, so physical gold and silver, you know, whatever form you buy it in is always gonna cost more than that spot price because it costs money to get gold and silver out of the ground. Um, and once you have it in a physical form, there is the demand premium. You know, when we see these big inflows into gold and silver, like we do when we have these major stock market corrections, the value of physical tangible gold and silver increases much more dramatically than paper gold and silver. Because the, the paper gold and silver, they can just make more financial instruments. They can dilute the value of that. With physical, they can't. There's a very limited supply of it that's out there. Mm -hmm. And when that supply meets a huge demand, the value of it increases. Do you have a, a, a slide that can or uh, that can demonstrate that? I do. Yeah. yeah, I do. So this slide right here, Sebastian, really shows that and how that plays out in a real world example. You know, during the last Great Recession we had 2008 to 2011, we had three years of people rushing into gold and silver. Silver hit its peak of the last 20 years in April of 2011. And you'll see the spot price for an ounce of silver was $47. Now, all the other forms that are on there are forms of physical, and we can see what they were all worth at that point in time. So we can see that silver bars were worth $49 an ounce. And that's because they can just make lots and lots of bars. There's, you know, there, there's basically kind of an unlimited amount of silver bars they can make. Same thing with silver rounds. Now, a, a maple leaf is a coin that's minted by the Canadian Mint. You're getting into sovereign minted coins there, and sovereign mints can only produce a certain amount of coins every year. So the supply of them is more limited, which is why we can see that silver maple leaves were worth $60 compared to the spot price of $47. What we recommend when people are buying gold and silver outside of their retirement accounts is U.S. minted coins that were minted before 1933. And one of the reasons why we really recommend those is because the supply of those is completely limited. They're not making any more of them. So when we had a big inflow of people rushing to gold and silver, a lot of demand for silver in April of 2011, supply was limited. And we can see pre-1933 coins were worth $84 compared to a spot price of 47 even compared to a maple leaf of 60, the pre-33 coins were worth an additional 40%. So if, if I'm gonna be buying um, this this uh, tangible gold and silver, yep. how much gold should I have? How much silver should I have? Should it be equal or more gold, less silver? How, how do you recommend that? Yeah, I say it really depends on, on your temperament as an investor. You know, to, to kind of explain, you know, the, the different characteristics of gold and silver, I often refer people to the old story of the tortoise and the hare. If you think of that story, gold is like the tortoise. It tends to be the slow and steady grower. 
Uh, silver is much more like the hair. You know, it's much more volatile. It bounces around. There's periods where it moves a lot, um, both forwards and backwards, and periods where it just kind of sits there and does nothing. The main difference between that story and reality is in the story, we knew exactly where the finish line was. In reality, I can't tell you when somebody's going to, you know, be forced to sell their gold and silver or choose to sell their gold and silver. Um, so for that reason, you know, once you know, you know, kind of how they, they react as a general starting place, I say a 50, 50 blend, you know, you're diversifying beyond other assets, diversify your metals purchase, go with the 50, 50 blend. If you're a little bit more aggressive with your investments, you know, do a 70, 30 split, 70% silver, 30% gold, but it's really going to depend on a case by case basis. Okay. And then if I'm getting all of this physical gold and silver in my possession, where am I going to store this? Uh, for me, I'm thinking, yeah, you know, this is going to take up a lot of space. And am I going to put this in a, a safety deposit box in a bank? I'm going to put in a storage facility. Where, where am I storing this gold and silver? Yeah, I think people have this, you know, this conception that, you know, say I buy $50,000 of gold or $50,000 of silver. Like, man, they're going to back the Brinks truck up to my house and they're going to be unloading bags of it for hours. And the reality is $50,000 of gold, you can hold that in the palm of your hand, Sebastian. 50000 in silver, that can fit into a large shoebox. So it doesn't take a lot of room to store the actual physical, tangible metals. My recommendation for most people is use a small home safe, a gun safe, you know, put it in a safety deposit box. Um, you know, we've got people that bury it in the backyard. It's really going to depend on, on each, each individual person. Um, I've got some folks that, you know, they literally will just put it in old cardboard boxes in their basement. Nobody knows they have it, you know, just keep it out of sight, out of mind. Don't make yourself a target. Right. Gotcha. And then if, and when it's time that I want to liquidate that gold, I want to turn it into, to spending power cash. Yeah you know, how, how yep. easy or how difficult is it for me to do that? It's it's incredibly easy with us at National Gold Consultants. It's as simple as calling us up, telling us, hey, I, I want to sell my gold and silver. We'll walk you through the process. It's as simple as, you know, packaging it up, sticking it in the mail, sending it back to us. And then as soon as we receive it, we'll cut you a check and get that in the mail to you. Oh, okay. So I just, the client will just contact national gold consultants to sell it. So I don't have to go find Correct. somewhere or someone to, to sell nope. it to or whatnot. Exactly. Yeah. And that, that's one of the beautiful things about pre 1933 gold and silver coins is they're not making any more of them. So we, we always want to buy them whenever somebody wants to sell. So, you know, one of the things that we really like about the pre 1933 coins is they are a completely private asset class. Uh, they're one of the few, you know, assets out there that there is literally no reporting required on them whatsoever, no matter how much a client buys or how much they sell. And whenever they do go to sell, there are never any 1099s issued on them. Whoa, whoa, whoa wait you know, So you're telling yeah. me that I don't have to pay taxes on that exchange? I'm, I'm telling you that there aren't any 1099s issued and okay. the reporting of that is on an honor system. So I, I can tell you in the great state of Minnesota, um, if you hold a garage sale, you are supposed to report the proceeds of that sale on your taxes. Right. Um, I can't say I've, I've ever met anybody that's done it. Understand. Okay. Sorry. Could you go ahead? <laughs> yeah, not a problem. <laughs> um, and then, you know, once again, there's that, that limited supply means there's a, a greater upside to them. And there's a, a huge market when you do go to sell. What's, what's really interesting about these coins to me is a lot of people don't know that, uh, you know, before 1933, we used both gold and silver coins in our general currency in the United States. And the reason these are a private asset class has to do with why we don't use those coins anymore. It's... Um, it, it really all changed May 1st of 1933 when President FDR, under Executive Order 6102, confiscated private ownership of gold. He made it illegal to own more than just a small amount. Think like a, a wedding ring. So if you had gold or silver, you know, if you had gold in your possession, you were required to take it to the bank 
turn that gold in and get paper dollars in return. And prior to that confiscation, gold was fixed at a value of $20 an ounce. So if you didn't have, you know, if, if you didn't turn in your gold and silver, you were subject to fines of up to $10,000 and up to 10 years in prison. And then once FDR had all the gold, he turned around and revalued it from $20 an ounce to $35 an ounce. It's really kind of the first great theft of, of American wealth. Did the same thing with silver a year later in August of 1934. And then eventually the, the government realized, hey, not everybody turned in their coins. They still had all these penalties out there. And, you know, to, to get around it, they just made the coins that survived a private asset class, meaning there is no reporting required on them. Wow. National Gold Consultants is a wholesaler of these co coins. Am I correct? Versus correct. A retailer? Yep. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so when someone goes to maybe some other uh, websites or, or distributors of gold, what other kind of gold are they looking at? And is, re is this really the best class or how does this compare to what they might find somewhere else? Yeah, I, I would say it definitely is. So, you know, what we see a lot is we see a lot of people that look at, you know, gold bars, for instance, mm -hmm. or silver bars. And we don't recommend bars for a number of reasons. First, I, I think people buy them uh, mainly because they're they're what's used in, you know, in movie heists, whenever they're breaking into a bank or anything like that, seems like they're, they're always stealing gold bars. The problem with gold bars, there, there are a number of problems with them. First of all, if you need to raise a little bit of cash, you can't just sell off a portion of a bar. You know, it's an all or nothing proposition. Right. Um, and you can't shave off a portion of it. The other problem with bars is there, there's something that's pretty easy to counterfeit. Um, it's easy for counterfeiters to have, you know, the gold or silver on the outside of the bar and a different metal on the inside of that bar. And it's something that we've run across a fair amount, um, you know, which the problem with bars is because of that counterfeiting risk. Most dealers don't really want to buy them back. They're happy to sell them to you. I mean, heck, even Costco sells, you know, gold and silver bars now. But, you know, like We'll use Costco as an example. In their fine print, they even state they won't buy them back. Mm. So finding somebody to, to actually buy those bars from you, you're going to be lucky to get 95% of the melt value of mm. those bars when you go to sell them. So we don't recommend bars for that reason. I would say the, the other type that some people think about are collectibles. You know, and these are coins that have been, you know, sent to a grading agency. They've been, you know, slabbed and graded, put in these hard plastic cases. You can't actually touch the coin. Um, and they really are just a, a collectible. The vast majority of their value is really driven by collector sentiment. Um, and that sentiment can shift really wildly and rapidly over time. It can be a, a, a fun but expensive hobby, but, you know, they should remain a hobby, just like you wouldn't have wanted to load up on Beanie Babies in the early 2000s. Right. You don't want to load up on collectibles. <laughs> yeah. um, you know, and so that leaves coins. We, you know, we've already kind of talked about the, uh, you know, just coins in general. Um, it can be broken down into two broad categories of coins. The first would be what are called rounds. Um, you know, these are coins that are produced by a private mint. Anybody could make these coins. Um, you know, Sebastian, you and I could start a company selling gold and silver rounds tomorrow. Uh, they're, they don't have a face value. They're not legal tender. The problem with the fact that anybody can make them is you don't really know exactly what you're getting. There, there's a lot of trust involved. It'd be like if you wanted to buy a new car, you know, you could buy one from a name brand like a, you know, a Ford or a Chevy or a Honda or Toyota, or you could buy a car somebody made in their garage from parts. Um, you know, it doesn't have a VIN number. It might run just as well, but it might not. And when you go to sell it, you know, you're, you're going to have a lot fewer people interested in buying the car that you, you know, bought from a guy who made it in his garage than a name brand. And that's really why we stick with sovereign minted coins. You know, these are coins that are minted by a sovereign country like the United States or Canada. They're legal tender. They have a face value. Um, Everybody knows exactly what they are. They're a known quantity, a proven winner. Um, they've got that pedigree. And there's a huge market when you're buying and when you're selling, which if you're doing this for wealth insurance reasons, it's why you want to stick to sovereign minted coins. 
you want that big market when you're buying and when you're selling. So if it's legal tender, forgive my ignorance, um, does that yeah. mean I could literally use that coin in exchange? I could go to the grocery store and spend it? Yeah, you, you technically could. I don't know why you would um, because even like a – like the United States makes one ounce gold coins to this day. They started doing that in 1984. And that one ounce gold coin has a face value of $50. So you, you could spend it for $50, whereas that coin itself, the gold in it is worth almost $3,000 today. But so you means, could do it, but I don't know why you would. Right, but that that means that has a, almost a double value. It's almost yeah. like the minimum base value of it is the legal tender yep. value and yep. then anything above that is the the actual value of the gold as correct. it increases based on market conditions correct yeah wow. that's awesome that's very powerful that that 10 to 15 percent number that we've talked about um you know that number isn't pulled out of thin air there is a company by the name of the cpm group their commodities research firm and they've done a study, you know, basically looking at a portfolio, a balanced portfolio from 1968 to 2020, wondering what would happen if you added gold to that portfolio. And what they found was that adding anywhere up to a 20% allocation to, you know, of gold into that portfolio decreased the average amount of risk in the portfolio and increased the average rate of return. So that's where that number is from. It's, you know, we, we like to be a little bit more conservative. It's why we say a 10 to 15% allocation because most people don't have any experience owning gold and silver. You know, you don't want to dive directly into the deep end of the pool. You know, start up at that 10 to 15% number. And, uh, you know, once you get a little bit more comfortable, then you can up your, your allocation from there. Awesome. Incredible. So now with that said, um, is there any other valuable information, any words of wisdom that you might want to share with the audience as it pertains to precious metals, gold and silver? Yeah, I mean, what, what I would say is, you know, there are so many economic storm clouds on the horizon right now. You know, you, you've got the federal deficit soaring, 35 trillion and growing from there. Um, you've got the, the dollar as the world's reserve currency under threat right now. Um, you've got, you know, all these geopolitical conflicts, whether that's, you know, the war in Ukraine or, you know, what's going on with Israel and Gaza. Um, you've got, you know, China saber rattling about Taiwan. You've got the political, you know, environment that we're in right now. You've got talk of taxes being raised. Um, in addition, the stock market just looks very overvalued right now. So there are all of these storm clouds on the horizon. I can't tell you which storm is going to hit, um, but I can tell you that storms happen. And the time to buy, you know, that umbrella is before the storm hits. The time to buy gold and silver is before those corrections come. And just one thing that, that I want to point out about, you know, the, the stock market in particular is you know, these major pullbacks that we have in the market, they're usual, they're routine. There's a reason why it's called a correction. It's supposed to happen. There's something that's wrong and that correction has to happen. And we can see the market looks overvalued now. It's why now is the time to own gold and silver, not when everything else has already fallen. I mean, sure, that's that's a good time to buy, but now is the time to really get in to provide that balance to your portfolio. Nathan Akers, everyone, thank you so much for spending time with me today and, and sharing your yeah. knowledge and, and your wisdom. Everyone watching, I'm going to put a link in the description below if you want to learn more information about how much you should be buying, if you're ready to start purchasing and, and adding gold and silver into your portfolio. Just look for the description in the link be below. Please make sure you like, subscribe, and share. Let YouTube know that this video and the content that we discussed here today was of value to you. Let other people know about this. Tell somebody who's going to tell somebody to watch this video. And uh, make sure you come back for more valuable content. Thanks for watching. It's the Approved Guy, Sebastian Boyer. God bless.